Hey, thanks for tuning into the Land and Home Show. Today we are talking about the politics, profits, and costs of living in the country. Hi, I'm Stephen Davy Davis, your land specialist and residential realtor here in central Kentucky and beyond. Um, today we are talking about three different concepts. Um, as far as the politics go, this is not about political issues per se. This is about eminent domain, um, zoning, uh, development, and all the things that go into that. Uh, in other words, we would call it police power uh, when, you, when you start to speak of it in technical terms. <clears throat> excuse me, for real estate, um, it's a bit of a scorcher. I'm already like sweating and hoping that I can get through all of this before my uh, camera overheats. Uh, I'm sitting in the shadiest spot I could possibly find. And of course my tripod broke, so I don't have a way to record inside my house. Uh, th anyway, we're gonna start with the politics of everything. Um, I, the, the real purpose of making this video is just to address a couple of ideas that I hear when dealing with buyers, uh, would-be buyers, people who are interested, uh, who maybe already have a country life out in another state, but would like to move here. And so some of it is Kentucky specific, some of it is a little bit more um, general, but we're going to cover some imminent domain stuff, uh, then some preconceptions about making money off of land and then some things you should know about costs of having it. So if we start with the political side, uh, I'm going to be using my my property as an example a lot today because, well, I own it and, um, and I do live it's somewhat of a country life. So where politics are concerned, um, a lot of people want to have their cake and eat it too. And it's possible. I certainly live that type of country life where you know, I'm eight minutes to two different grocery stores. I don't have to travel far at all in the case of an emergency, like hospital wise. Um, <clears throat> I live in what's called a rural service boundary. So um, I'm in Lexington, but there is a division between the urban services and the rural services. So out here, I have a septic system. I have to pay for my trash. I have a couple different choices for electric, elect electric service providers. Um, my internet is yeah, kind of spotty and I'm surrounded by lots of farms, namely thoroughbred farms, um, because this is the horse capital of the world. So uh, there's an Arab prince that owns the property next door to me, uh, 750 acre thoroughbred farm, one of I think three different contiguous parcels that this particular prince owns. So like that's my kind of area. That's where I live. Um, and it is on the cusp of all of the urban stuff. So because I am so close, um, the urban growth pattern does this a lot of times. I'm an, an advocate for it doing this growing up instead of out, but um, the real heart of the issue when you live near an urbanized area or a place where there are more people concentrated uh, meanwhile, you're wanting or you already have land or property that's near it is you're, you're often in the path of that growth. And um, I didn't consider that before we bought this place. And, uh, and now here we are kind of having a very convoluted fight with uh, the transportation cabinet among other other arms of the government, um, myself and my neighbors at large. So my, my road is about seven and a half miles long. And like I said, it's on the cusp of all of this urban stuff. Um, and you know, there's talk about widening our roads and making it easier for other counties to get to the interstate, which is that way, um, by widening other roads and, and all of this stuff, uh, which would result in people, you know, losing, some of their land, including myself. Um, and it's not all that exciting. Um, most of us are here because of the peace and quiet. Um, certainly my neighbors, the, the farms that are here are because, you know, there is space for that stuff. You know, I didn't move here for walking accessibility and street lights and lots of traffic. I moved here for 
the opposite of all that, to have the opposite of all of that. Um, anyway, so political ramifications of having your cake and eating it too, you know, I want to live close to the city, but not too far, um, into the boonies or something like when you want something like that, you need to consider what it is that, that that particular area is experiencing in terms of growth, population change, jobs that could be coming, how big of an employer that might be, that kind of thing. Um, your real estate agent is not always going to know every single city and every single county, um, it, like have a pulse on all, all of that. Um, certainly can direct you in the right direction, but uh, I, I can't keep all that locked up here and I, I don't really know <laughs> who can. Um, if we move into the profits aspect, there are two things I really want to address because they're two of the most common uh, concepts that I hear spoken in, in one way or another. And the first goes something like, oh, I'll just get it cut for hay. So let's talk about hay. Um, hay is basically, it's grass that grows up. Uh, you only cut it about twice a year around here. So actually, last week this whole area was just like covered in dust and smog and haze because, excuse me, everyone was doing their first cut. Um, so you generally cut like somewhere around the beginning of the summer and then you cut later on maybe in, I don't know, September or October or something like that. Of course, this all depends on the weather. But hay is grass that grows, you cut it down, you let it dry. If you're doing haylage, then that means you may cut it a little earlier and then you like shrink wrap it into like a big roll. Whereas traditional hay is, it just sits out in the big roll. Um, and I guess some people do squares, but I don't see that around here very much. Um, but you let it dry so that uh, you have food feed, food feed, whatever, for your livestock and or horses once winter comes around, when there is no grass to graze, um, when everything goes to sleep. Um, so that's how hay works. And when people talk about either paying their property taxes with hay or uh, making a profit off of their hay, there are three things that really need to be, four that really need to be, you know, in tandem for that to work. First of all, if you're truly going to make money, you're not talking about a little bit of country living. You're talking about scale. You need a whole lot of land in order to make hay worthwhile for you, um, like hundreds of acres. You're not going to make a profit off of a five acre section of field that you have out of your 20, or even a 40 acre section of uh, a field out of 80. Um, you need a lot of, you need a lot of hay. <laughs> Um, so scale is huge. If you're, if you're trying to make it a business, if you're trying to make passive income, um, you're going to need some scale there. Um, but beyond that, you really need three other things. If you're talking about offsetting your property taxes a little bit and that type of thing, you need quality, you need proximity, and you need demand. Okay, And so these three things are all very intertwined. I say quality because not all grass is created equally. For instance, I said earlier that I live next to 750 acre thoroughbred farm. Thoroughbreds are the Formula One racing horse of, of all the horses. They're the most expensive. It's, it's why a, a prince owns this farm. Um, so very expensive, very top-notch athletes, and as such, they are fed top-notch food. What I grow naturally, or rather what grows naturally in my backyard of 13 acres is not the kind of quality that they're feeding a thoroughbred horse. Um, and because I very much live in, a, in the county where most farms, if they are farms, are horse farms, I don't really have a market for a lesser product. Um, there are cattle farms here in Kentucky, but I don't live super close to any, not any that would need to travel all the way over here, which is the proximity aspect with a tractor that has a cutter on the back and then coming back with a tractor that has a, a rake on it and coming back with 
hay balers and then trucking all of that out on a hay trailer like that's a lot of gas it's a lot of labor it's a lot of time i don't live close enough to that type of market therefore i don't really have a demand for it in my immediate area and so without those three things there's no selling or donating or really giving any of that stuff to anybody nearby um you know, and if I wanted to do it myself, we're talking about I need a I need a tractor. Tractor on the on the used side, if it's going to be reliable, you're at least twenty grand. You need a hay cutter. You need a a, a rake. You need uh, a baler. You probably need some sort of spreader for when things um, like when the new season comes up. You want good stuff to grow in the ground, so that means then you need seed. Then, of course, you're fertilizing a, a large space. Like, you're talking about a pretty big infrastructure. And that's the thing for hay. Like, whether you're cutting for 20 acres or 200 acres or 2,000, the overhead cost of just, like, bare minimum equipment is the same for all of it. You don't get to ride on a wagon because you only have five acres of hay. Like, you still need to cut it down with, like, a really big big machine you still need a baler you, st you still need all of that stuff regardless of if you have this much space or this much space so it's not super realistic to think that you would do it all yourself because um, you need specialized equipment and then if you buy all of that you'd certainly not be making a profit anymore because it's going to take you a long time to get out of that hole whether you finance it or pay cash like the return on that investment is going to be pretty low um, or at least take a very long time to get out of. And then on the having someone do it for you, they just, they need to be near nearby enough. You need to have quality enough of a product, you know, quality enough grass um, that will then become hay and you absolutely need the demand for it. So demand meaning, so maybe there are animals that, like I have, there are animals nearby. I have the proximity. I might have the quality, I have a lot of tall fescue, but I have a lot of other weeds and stuff mixed in, but let's pretend that I had the quality. The demand is not there though. What I'm growing is not sufficient for the type of uh, animals that are raised next door to me and in my general area. Um, I'd have to be in some other county where it's much more prevalent that there are cattle farmers for someone to drive all the way to my place in order to do all of the processing and the entire you know, kit and caboodle for hay to make sense. Um, so the hay thing, it's not that you can't get your place cut for hay, but if you're thinking that, you know, hay is just going to like stuff money in your pockets on 50 acres or less, um, you're probably being unrealistic. Um, if you want more than 50 acres or, you know, you have a bunch of your own farm equipment and you can put in that sweat equity, whatever, um, you know, it's, it, it may be possible to squeeze some profit margin out of that or to squeeze, um, a, a, a what's the word I'm looking for a sizable credit out of your property tax um, but that also depends on you know what your property taxes are like I live in a county where we have some of the highest property taxes in the state so you know it's just it's really not worth it for me other than if there was someone close enough who's just gonna come and do it and I pretty much have to do nothing um, then it's kind of free money but uh, that's hey uh, the second profit idea that I often hear talked about is, well, I'll just sell the trees for timber. Um, and it's a very similar idea to, hey, um, in order to truly make profits off of timber, you need scale first. So I've got two acres or so of woods. I don't know if my contrast is set high or low enough, but you can kind of see trees way back there. I, I own all of that back there. and some more that you can't see because of elevation change and, and it's wood, two acres of woods. Um, two acres of woods is not enough for a profit. You need hundreds of acres for continual profitable stuff because you have different stages of succession in a timber stand. You have 20 year old trees and you have saplings and you have stuff in the middle um, age wise that make it such that you can make a profit, you know, every five to seven years and that type of thing. So scale is very, very important with timber. Um, sure, might you have a few profitable trees, 100% and profitable is all dependent on those ideas, again, of proximity, um, quality and demand. Um, 
Right now, one of the highest demand trees is, is white oak. I have tons of red oaks, of course, <laughs> no white oaks, um, but I have tons of, ton, tons of red oaks, not as valuable of a tree. Um, but that's kind of the idea of quality. What is the type of tree? Because people don't want a hackberry tree the way they, they want a black walnut tree or the way that they want a, a white oak or even a, um, I don't know, uh, a cherry tree and these prices are all in flux and I don't honestly even have a good idea of exactly um, how these trees rank at the moment but in any case not all trees are created equally in terms of quality and then even if you do have one of say you've got a great white oak if it's got branches all over it and it's crooked and gnarly and stuff there's a whole rating system of, of how valuable even the species of tree is you know is it in is it in good condition is it like a middle condition tree or is it poor and i'm mixing up some of my ter terminology but it's pretty much a three-tier system of of rating the grade of that that tree that may come down so that's quality you need the demand um what do people want around the area are there lots of furniture makers are there man i'm getting eaten by ants uh are there lots of is there a cooperage? A cooperage is a, is a company or a person that creates bourbon barrels, hence why White Oak is in such high demand here. We do make 95% of the world's bourbon. Um, uh, demand, you know, what is your, what's your local market? And proximity is huge too, because, you know, say you live all the way out, you know, I don't know, two hours away from Lexington um, with, five really wonderful trees well if there's no sawmill there um or really active like mobile processing situation for you know trucking logs and stuff like you may be too far for it to be worth it you might be able to process that tree yourself and cut up into some usable chunks to make your own furniture or something like that but um you really need the proximity for that amount of machinery to come out and do something. For me, I'm close to a lot of that stuff. However, I don't have enough of it for it to be super profitable. If I cut down one of these trees, I've got a lot of cherries, a few hickories, um, like I said, red oaks, I'd be doing it for a small time project or for, I don't know, maybe a couple grand in my pocket or, or something, which is nothing to sneeze at, but a couple grand is not gonna sustain me a year. Um, and, and the only reason why I can manage to do that if I wanted to is because I live in a place where there are sawmills and lumber yards and things where they could provide that service where they're not spending a whole bunch of uh, fuel and bringing a whole bunch of heavy machinery to work on one tree or two trees. Um, it could be something where their labor still was under what they could make as a profit margin uh, while still paying me. To, to take that tree. Um, so those are two of the profit ideas I often hear when I, when I hear people talking about country living. And again, when I say country living, uh, I'm really talking like the, the less than 50 acre sort of situation. If you're running a commercial farm, there were, this is a, a, a totally different thing. Um, but if you are living on 15, 20, 35, 40 acres, that type of thing, that's, that's really the heart of, uh, of what I'm addressing. And so then, we get into cost. Um, the first is mowing. And <laughs> mowing is uh, basically a choice between sweat equity slash time and writing a check. So as I've mentioned, 13 acres is what, was, was, is what is within my property boundary. I do not cut my own grass, okay? My spouse does not cut the grass. We don't have time for that. I am fully employed, full time, right? Um, and it's just, it's just not possible. When people come here each week, the, the lawn service we hire, um, they're a crew of six at least. And to do everything, it takes them 18 hours. Sorry, 18 man hours, so three hours in that day. So three hours on a Tuesday for six guys uh, to come here and get everything mowed and cleaned up and edge and all that stuff, it takes them a grand total of 18 man hours. I don't have 18 hours each week to make that happen. 
I just don't. And, and maybe you do, but when you start to talk about really, really large spaces, um, that's how you have to conceive of um, managing it. It's either gonna be your time or it's gonna be someone else that comes and does it. Um, and it may be someone who does own a tractor. Maybe you're not getting it cut for hay, but who can cut it a little bit more quickly on a tractor, tractor with a bush hog behind it, um, but it's still gonna cost you money. Or maybe you've decided to buy your own tractor at some great cost in order to do it yourself, but you're going to be spending money and you're and or you will be spending time in order to just keep your property in like a visually appealing condition. We're not talking about like show stopping. There's plenty of things that I could work on here, um, but just to keep it mowed so that you don't have grass this high, which is actually what you would have for most of the spring and summer season um, if you were doing hay, but to, to make it such that you didn't have grass this high and you just had a, you know, a normal looking like carpet of grass instead of like a prairie of grass. So it's either spend money and time or just spend money. Um, but those are, that's a cost that should come into serious consideration. Um, wooded properties are certainly easier to manage, especially if you're not managing it for any sort of, you know, timber stand, you know, to profit off of it. Like you can pretty much just leave the woods as they are and, you know, take dead wood and burn it or grow mushrooms out of it. You can do lots of things. So, you know, the more wooded, you definitely have uh, less sweat equity to put in. Uh, but if you want a lot of wide open spaces, um, you're going to have a lot to manage or a lot of money to shell out when, uh, when the grass is in active growing season. Another cost, fencing. Um, people love good fences, and the thing is that they don't stay good. If you've got a lot of trees, they, they rain down their pollen and their um, chlorophyll, and birds do things on them and, and things like that. It's just, uh, they don't stay good forever, and lumber is expensive, labor is expensive, um, and it may not be expensive for you, but it's a consideration that none of this stays in a permanent state of pristineness. So, um, you know, for me, if we go back to the beginning of the conversation about, you know, political power, police power, eminent domain, you know, they're wanting to widen some road and people do crash into my fence regularly. Um, it is a cost that is just into the budget of, uh, of yearly upkeep because unfortunately people are not honest. So a lot of people that crash into the fence, not only are they entitled driving that fast, yes, I'm gonna get on a soapbox for a quick second, but a lot of this whole expanding the road thing is a safety issue, which I think would just embolden people to drive faster, which would still result in my fence getting totally sc screwed up. Um, so that's my stance on that. But in any case, my fence does get destroyed a lot. And um, whether it's people's hubris or honest to God accident, um, that couldn't have been avoided, I think it's the former, uh, people do, they hit and run. Um, people will crash into my fence, they don't leave a note, they don't stick around, and it's left to, to me to fix it. And then everywhere else on the property, you know, trees grow. And like I've got a, a walnut tree that is pressing right now on planks of a section of fence that, you know, I'm gonna have to replace that so that the tree is not damaged and also so that, you know, the breaking planks that, that are you know slowly starting to to bend and splinter um so that i can just encase it in a in a less dumb way i guess <laughs> so there's always stuff to do deer run through fences during the rut um there's just there's maintenance and then speaking of deer brings me to the last cost which is wildlife the amount of wood destroying organisms on this property are insane. There's a new family. I don't know if you can see the shed back there, if it's in the shop, but I've got an outbuilding here um, of maybe six or seven groundhogs that were just born, which are frankly kind of cute. All baby animals tend to be, um, but they chew, they chew on, on wood. They chew on everything. So, um, the bottom of this building is, you know, getting damaged. The bottom of another building I have is getting damaged. Um, we have like three different types of woodpeckers here, all of which I think exist on my property. 
gorgeous, but they drill holes right through my fence posts all, all over the property. Um, I, I mentioned deer, there are moles, and because I have so much space, I don't treat my lawn with like some widespread pesticide, but you know, I have all these unsightly mounds in different places. I guess they're just following wherever the food is going, but that's not fun. Um, there's, there's always something wildlife wise, um, little critters that get into my pool some kind of way that I've got to fish out, um, sick animals, whatever. Now I'm just going down a list of, of annoyances, but, um, but animals do destroy property as well. And, you know, it's finding that balance of prevention, um, and then eventually repair because they will get into something. They will do something. So to wrap everything up, um, this is, of course, just me trying to get your head around some ideas because if you've never lived in a situation like this um, where you're somewhat rural or completely rural, um, the, the pros seem really obvious and they seem really, really doable, really easy, and um, sometimes they can be. But oftentimes I, I find that people underestimate what it is they're they're in for in terms of management costs of repairs upkeep that kind of thing um, it's not to dissuade you it's just to be real um, and i think that's really all i've got uh, we've got more videos coming up about country living um, that may help you understand that maybe you don't need as much space um, i believe my friend lives on like three and a half acres and it's just oh my gosh it's so gorgeous the things that he grows it's incredible. Um, you don't necessarily need a lot of space. And then for some people, you want all the space, you want to hunt, you want to do whatever. And, and just trying to help you understand what are your potential and regular obstacles for, for having that life. That's all. Um, so hopefully this helps. Leave me your comments, your questions below, or get in touch with me via email. Uh, can't wait to share more with you, and my camera did not overheat this whole time, so I won't press my luck. I'm going to say goodbye. Peace.